So, the first time I talked to this group, which I think, my notes aren't perfect on this, so I think was in 1989, Bonnie. Um, I said uh, this, infectious agents probably can trigger and perpetuate CFS. Not necessarily in all cases, but in many. The agents cannot be fully eradicated by the immune system. That is, those agents that can cause CFS may be very different from one another in many respects, but they will share uh, the property of not being fully eradicated by the immune system. Third, there is evidence that CFS can follow a new infection. I talked about several studies in the literature that showed people getting a new infection and going on to CFS, but those were small studies, not very many people. Uh, and it is possible that in CFS, different infectious agents interact to cause symptoms, just what I said a minute ago. So those were the points we made now more than 20 years ago. Um, and uh, those are the points that I think still will prove to be true, and I'll talk about them. Next slide. So which infectious agents have been linked to chronic fatigue syndrome? One is Epstein-Barr virus. There are some people, but a minority of people with CFS, whose CFS began following an initial infection with Epstein-Barr virus. There are other people whose in CFS has followed Q fever, a kind of illness that is found mainly in farming communities because that's where the bacteria that causes it lives. Ross River virus. Lyme disease, which is a bacterial infection, can lead to CFS. Parvovirus, another virus, can lead to CFS. And we published a paper just a month ago, you know, primarily work done by Jonathan Kerr in London, uh, that I think shows this pretty nicely. Enteroviruses uh, are another class of infectious agent that I think is, have been linked to CFS. Maybe an illness, an agent called Borna disease virus, but that's not solid. A, her a herpes virus called human herpes virus 6 that I'll talk a little bit about, that we've spent a lot of time studying. And then lately, starting last October, a retrovirus called xenotropic murine leukemia related virus, XMRV, uh, that I'll talk about in a moment as well. Next slide. A very important study was published in uh, 2006, organized by the CDC, conducted in Australia, uh, in a very small community in Australia, where there was only a small group of doctors, one hospital, one laboratory, farming community surrounded by miles and miles of nothing. So people lived in that community. They got their medical care in that community. They got their ongoing medical care in that community. And you could follow what happened to every single person in that community who got a particular type of infection and know that you were going to be able to follow all of them for several years. Couldn't do that in Boston, Massachusetts. <laughs> 256 patients who had had three different kinds of infections were followed uh, over the course of one year in the, in the first report. 11% of them developed chronic fatigue syndrome. It was the same percentage with each of those very different infectious agents. And CFS was more likely to occur in the people who, whose illness was most severe initially and who were producing these cytokines, these immune system chemicals that I've said are the way the immune system orchestrates an attack against an infectious agent. And the cytokines that I've said, in my judgment, are very likely the cause of the symptoms of CFS. Most important, they were able to study the psychology of these patients before they got sick and after they developed CFS, and they could not find any psychiatric factors or socioeconomic or demographic factors 
that made people more likely to develop CFS. It was not, for example, the people who had had a history of depression who got one of these infections who then went on to develop CFS. They, that happened, but it happened just as often in people without depression. So no psychiatric link that they could find. And the, the, Dr. Hickey, the first author of this study, is a psychiatrist. And he was looking for that. Next slide. Enteroviral infection. This is, there is really one investigator, Dr. John Cha in Los Angeles, who has done most of this work. And until uh, one person's work is replicated by many others, it's all, all of us take it with a grain of salt. But he has uh, biopsied the stomach, the lining of the stomach in people with CFS typically people who had a lot of stomach symptoms as part of their CFS, and found enteroviruses in the uh, lining of the stomach much more often in CFS patients than in healthy controls. Next slide. This is just a picture to show you what he sees. The brown stain in this stomach biopsy is a stain for the virus, and this is a stain with another virus on the right that doesn't stain brown. So, and healthy people's uh, biopsies don't show this brown stain the way the CFS patients do. So his studies are fairly persuasive that this kind of virus, enterovirus, is in the gut more often in patients with CFS. Whether it is actually causing the illness remains to be seen. Next slide. Neurologic findings are present in many, but not all, patients with CFS. And I spe I'm specifying episodes of encephalitis when the illness began. Me uh, what are called white matter abnormalities in the brain. Part of the brain is called the white matter on MRI scans. And brain wave abnormalities. Next slide. The virus called human herpes virus 6, or HHV6, uh, was discovered about 20 years ago, although it's been with us for thousands, with our species, the human race, for thousands of years. What we have learned about the virus in the last 20 years that we've been studying it uh, and others in CFS is that it can definitely infect cells of the brain when those cells are in the test tube, uh, that it can cause seizures in children and indeed is the most common cause of, of seizures in very small children, that it persists in the brain, the CNS, for years after primary infection, maybe forever, that it causes encephalitis not just in kids but in older people, uh, and people whose immune systems are suppressed, and people whose immune systems are perfectly fine, that it causes demyelination, a condition that's seen, for example, in multiple sclerosis in both infants and children who are immunosuppressed or uh, whose immune systems are fine, that it is associated with multiple sclerosis, and in the last few years, that it is associated with temporal lobe seizure disorders. Now, that's interesting because I've told you earlier that in, in chronic fatigue syndrome, there are MRI abnormalities in the white matter of the brain, uh, just as there are with multiple sclerosis. I've told you that there are brainwave abnormalities, just as there are in people with seizures. But those abnormalities are different. So it, it doesn't mean that there's any link between CFS and demyelinating diseases like multiple sclerosis or temporal lobe seizures, but it suggests that there could be and that this infectious agent could be the, the explanation linking the two in those people who have those abnormalities. Next slide. The studies of active infection with this virus in CFS uh, that show a positive association uh, on, in the left here, I wish my pointer were working, uh, are many more numerous, the studies, than the studies, the smaller number that don't show an association. And the number of patients in the studies 
that show the viruses associated with CFS are nearly tenfold higher than the number of patients in the studies where no association is seen. So there is a link, I believe, between this virus and some cases of CFS. Whether that means the virus causes CFS remains to be shown. Next slide. 